Hello, everybody, and happy Friday. This is your video lecture on Chapter 24 to sort of take the place of Thursday's Zoom lecture that I missed because I was not feeling well. <sighs> I'm still not feeling great, but I don't want to get behind, so I want to make a quick little video for you. So what I'm going to do in this video is introduce Chapter 24, cover about half of it, and then on Tuesday's Zoom lecture, I will cover the other half. Let me just say this is going to be a somewhat challenging chapter to teach because it's a very visual chapter. There's lots of demonstrations that I do when teaching this chapter, and I don't have any of that equipment. It's all on campus, and I can't get to it. So I will show you some videos. Uh, John, our lab tech, created a really great video showing all sorts of magnetism demos. I put that on your YouTube playlist and I will link to it on your online resources page, and I would highly recommend that you take some time and watch some of those videos. So chapter 24 is all about magnetism, and many of you are familiar with just magnets from putting things on your refrigerator, or hopefully you played with magnets as a kid. What I want to do is sort of go through the actual physics behind what's going on. So here's what we're going to cover in chapter 24. So I'm going to talk about what magnetic forces are, what creates magnetic forces, and a little preview. All moving charges create a magnetic field around them. And what we now know is that magnetism and electricity are not two separate subjects. They're not two separate phenomenon. In physics, we talk about electromagnetism. They are both just different aspects of the same force. So as a little preview, if, let's say I had two positive charges. We know from chapter 22 that these charges will repel each other. Oh, should have been a straight line, but they repel each other away from each other. They exert electrical forces on each other. If a charge is at rest, it will affect the space around it and create what's called an electric field. But here's the thing. If a charge is moving, a moving charge creates a magnetic field around it in addition to an electric field. And what we now know, and this is something that Einstein discovered, is that all magnetism basically comes from moving electric charges. It's pretty amazing. These little things called electrons and protons and neutrons, well, mostly electrons, if you think about, they are responsible for so much interesting stuff in terms of electricity and magnetism and so on and so forth. So we're going to talk a little bit about sources of magnetic forces, magnetic poles, and magnetic fields. Then I'm going to talk about magnetic domains. This is why some pieces of iron and nickel and cobalt, which are the th three main types of materials that can be magnetized, some pieces of iron are magnetic, some pieces aren't. Why? And the answer has to do with something called magnetic domains. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about electromagnets. Since moving charges create electric or magnetic fields, an electromagnet can be created just by sending a current through a wire. That moving current will create a magnetic field. And so in essence, an electromagnet is a magnetic field that I can turn on and off by just turning on and off a switch and letting current flow in a circuit or not. Then we'll look at magnetic force on moving charges. I'm not going to deal with magnetic force on a current carrying wire. And then the last thing we'll look at is the Earth's magnetic field. And what we'll see is that the Earth's magnetic field is really beneficial to us. If the Earth didn't have a magnetic field, you would not be at home right now watching this fascinating online lecture. Okay, so most of you are familiar with what magnets do. What I want to try, I haven't done this before, but I embedded a video into OneNote. I want to see how this works. So just as a little, uh, let's try this. Oof. Let me just fast forward a little bit. Hey, oh, let's bring in, in Physics 10. 10. Video, video. What happened there? Video update. Did I go to a different page? Office hours, no. <laughs> I just lost it. OK, that's fun, 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 fun. So I'm not going to edit this because I have actually started and stopped this video like five or ten times trying to make it perfect. So I'm giving that up. So let's try playing this on YouTube. 
everybody is probably pretty familiar that if we have a magnet, uh, what the, you know, the most basic thing we know about magnets is they, they stick to metal things, right? They stick to your refrigerator or they stick to nails and you can pick things up with them. That's our main experience with magnets. Um, we also kind of know that they don't stick to stuff like wood, things like that. So they, they stick to metal things, but quick little pause. One of the things that we're going to go through is that there's only certain kinds of material that can be magnetized. And the three main kinds are iron, nickel, and cobalt. Those are the three kinds of materials that can generally be magnetized. And we'll see the reason they can be magnetized is because iron, nickel, and cobalt have more electrons spinning in one direction than they do another. And I know I haven't gotten to that yet, but most magnetism comes from moving electrons and some kinds of atoms, iron, nickel, and cobalt, have more electrons, what's called spinning in one direction than in another direction, which means they are magnetic overall. So the things that can be magnetized are things that contain iron, nickel, and cobalt. Continuing forth. Which is like, huh, why do they stick to metal things? And another thing we know about magnets, we learned a long time ago, humans did, that if you take a magnet, and you put it on some bearing or something so it can rotate around, that uh, it's gonna tend to want to point in a certain direction. And it, we figured out that, huh, one end of it likes to point north. That's pretty convenient. Uh, if you're a sailor or somebody lost in the forest or something and you wanna figure out which way is north, you can take a magnet and it's gonna always point you north. And so... So quick little pause. In dealing with electric charges, what we know is that opposite charges attract, like charges repel, we consider positive charges and negative charges. For magnetism, we're not dealing with positive and negative charges. What we're dealing with is north and south poles. And let me just mention right now, north pole is short for north seeking pole. South pole is short for south seeking pole which means if I put a magnet on a piece of string and just let it rotate, that magnet will naturally align with the Earth's magnetic field and the north end of the magnet will be the end of the magnet that points to geographic north. And I'm specific about geographic north because there's a difference between geographic north and magnetic north that I'll get to in a little while. We named that end of the magnet that wants to point north, we called it, that's the north end of the magnet. And you can, we often will mark it with something like put a piece of tape on a red mark or something and say, that's the north end of the magnet because it wants to point north. And if I keep spinning it around, the north end of the magnet wants to point north. Pretty cool. So what should we call the other end of the magnet? Oh, oh I know. How about the south. Call it south? So now we have magnets at north end and the south end. And that's a different kind of thing than with electricity, we learned that there was positive and negative, right? So one thing about poles, just like opposite charges attract, like charges repel, same thing is true for magnetism. Opposite poles attract, like poles repel. So the north pole of one magnet will be attracted to the south pole of another magnet, and two north poles of two different magnets will repel, two south poles of two different magnets will repel. So with magnets, uh, is there a relationship? Is there some kind of connection between the north and the south of a magnet and a positive and negative of, of electricity? We'll look at that a little bit later. Um, so if I have, right, I can take a another, I can take a fancier magnet, say like this, and make a better bearing and make a really nice bearing and make it really light so it can be sensitive. And there's my, there's my compass, right? Quick little pause. What is a compass? A compass is simply a magnet, which is free to rotate. And a magnet will always align with the magnetic field around it. And if there's no strong magnets nearby or other pieces of metal that could possibly affect things, then a compass will align with the Earth's magnetic field. And so all that's happening is opposite poles attract, the poles of a magnet will line up with the Earth's magnetic field, and I'll get to that more later. But all the compasses 
is just a magnet that's free to rotate so it can spin on its axis. And again, that north end of the, the magnet wants to point to the north. Okay, another question we can ask is how do two magnets interact with each other? So first of all, we notice that this solar end of this magnet, this compass is pointing north. So we know the silver side is the north side and the dark side is the south side. And then we have our other magnet here. We know the red side is the north side. And if I turn that toward that magnet, it looks like the north side of this magnet attracts the dark side of that magnet, which we said was the south. And if I turn it around, it looks like the south side of this magnet attracts the north side. Okay. So just like I was saying, opposite poles attract. So the north pole of one magnet will be attracted to the south pole of another magnet, like poles repel. Okay, so let's stop that for now. Go back to lecture notes and just talk a little bit about magnetism's discovery. So magnetism, the term, where does magnetism comes from? Comes from the fact that in a region called magnesia, which is in Greece, lodestones were found and used about 2,000 years ago. A lodestone is just a stone which is naturally magnetic. And it's naturally magnetic because it contains some combination of iron, nickel, and cobalt. Notice, demo, I would have passed around a lodestone and a magnet, or a compass, and you would have seen that there are certain kinds of rocks that are naturally magnetic. Well, Fast forward a bit of time, it was the Chinese in about the 12th century that realized that you could use magnets to steer and to basically navigate. And so we first started using magnets to steer about the 12th century. And for a long, long, long time, magnetism and electricity were considered to be two separate topics, completely unrelated. And interestingly enough, 1820, it was a high school teacher who was doing a lecture on electricity and magnetism, and he discovered that a current in a wire would deflect a magnet. And actually being a good scientist, they didn't just dismiss it, started thinking, well, if a current causes a compass to rotate, that must be because the current carrying wire produces a magnetic field which is affecting the compass. So actually let's watch just a quick little video. And this is actually a video from Paul Hewitt who wrote the textbook conceptual physics that we're using in class. So one, I'm looking at the study area in your Mastering Physics website. And if you click on launch the study area, which you'll get, let's just do it, is a little study area that contains a bunch of information for each chapter. So right now we're at chapter 24. Go to chapter 24, hit go. And what it's gonna give you is for each one of these, this is just the section of the textbook. So if you click on that, it'll open up the electronic version of the textbook. One, any kind of interactive figures it has, it'll show and I'll open this. Oh, actually, let's just do this right now. Can I make this bigger? Okay, so what this interactive video is showing, or interactive figure, is I have a simple circuit, a battery connected with some wires. Here's a switch, and then the wire is passing close to a magnet. Right now, the battery voltage is zero. So what this is showing is that if I close the switch, so right now it's open, if I close the switch and I send a current through the wire, what happens is the wire gets deflected. Why does the wire get deflected? Because basically the moving current creates a magnetic field which gets affected by the magnet that's already present. So when there's no current flowing, the wire is not affected by the magnet, but when I close the switch and send a current through the wire, that wire is then deflected by a strong magnetic field. What we learned from this, again, this was in the early 1800s, was that electricity and magnetism are not separate. 
all magnetism comes from moving electric charges. So the other thing is under videos here. There's all these different videos. The one I want to show you and try out, and I haven't actually shown a video in an online lecture before, well, just the one I did before, is Orsted's discovery. So Orsted was basically the person that really first discovered that moving charges create an electric field. So let's just watch this quick two minute video. The source of that magnetism was betrayed years ago, more than 150 years ago, by a fellow by the name of Hans Christian Orsted. He was a professor type teaching, I believe he was in a high school classroom. And he was showing the students that there's no relationship between magnetism and electricity. The physics books at that time had electricity as one subject and magnetism as another. And Burstard was showing there's no relationship between the two. And one of the things he would do is he would line up the piece of wire like this and put it over a magnet, pass a current through it, and you really don't see anything happening. There's no interaction. But after class, a student came up and held the wire in this direction. And when a current passed through it, okay, watch this. When a current is passed over the wire like this, boom, you see that interaction? It turns out there is an interaction between a current carrying wire and a magnet. And it turns out, to make a long story short, the source of all magnetism is moving electric charges. And when the charges move through the wire, they set up about the wire a magnetic field. And that magnetic field is in concentric loops around the wire. Okay, so one, this is sort of an apocryphal story. I don't know if it happened exactly the way it happened, but what we do know is that Orsted was doing a lecture, probably a high school physics lecture, and talking about circuits and magnetism. The way I heard it was that he had a compass next to his circuit, and he noticed that whenever he closed the circuit so that current was flowing, it would affect the compass. And then being a good scientist, he didn't just dismiss it, started thinking that if the compass is deflected by a current carrying wire, it must be because of that current carrying wire is producing a magnetic field. Okay, so that's sort of a big little introduction. Let's dive into a little bit of chapter 24. And actually, I'm going to first ask you a little clicker question. So this is question is just, this is how I would have began the chapter had we been talking live. It says, the magnetic field of the Earth is useful to us. Why? Why is the Earth's magnetic field useful to us? The answer is, in essence, all of the above. So one, I mean, I don't know if this is useful to us, but many creatures navigate by the Earth's magnetic field. Things like carrier pigeons and other birds actually have an organ in their brain that can sense the magnetic fields of whatever, so it can navigate by using the magnetic field of the Earth. In essence, it's like they have a compass in their brain. One, this is what's hugely important to us, is that there's these things called cosmic rays that are very, 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 very high energy particles coming from the sun and other sources, excuse me, that if the Earth did not have a magnetic field, these high energy charged particles would enter the Earth's atmosphere and they would wreak havoc on the Earth. But Luckily, we do have a magnetic field, and that magnetic field either deflects or traps most of the cosmic rays coming from space. And the other thing is it gives us some information about the interior of the Earth. Just real quick, all magnetism comes from moving electric charges, and from the fact that the Earth has a magnetic field, we believe it's because the Earth has a molten lava or molten core and inside the Earth's core, you basically have this moving electric charge. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so going back, here's what we know from chapter 22. Is if I have two charges, let's say they're opposite charges, they're going to attract each other electrically. Opposite charges attract, like charges repel. So if I have two positive charges, they're going to repel each other. Two negative charges will repel each other two opposite charges will attract each other. So charged particles at rest exert electrical forces on each other. Why? 
because any time I place a charged particle in space, it will literally change the space around it and create what's called an electric field. Here's the cool thing. If these charges are moving, not only do they have an electric field around them, they also have a magnetic field, which means that if they are moving, in addition to creating electric fields and having electrical forces on each other, they will also create magnetic fields and exert magnetic forces on each other. So first really big point of this chapter is all magnetism comes from moving electric charge. All magnetism comes from the fact that a charge is moving and a moving charge will create a magnetic field. A stationary charge, so if I just have an electron out in space, this electron will affect the space around it and it creates what's called an electric field. Let's actually make this a positive charge. And the electric field, we draw with field lines. And field lines basically is just a way of representing something you can't see. And a little reminder, the way these field lines work is the direction the field line point shows the direction of the electric field. So if this line is pointing away from this positive charge, that means the electric field is pointing away. And the closer together the lines are, the stronger the electric field. So like here, the lines are closer together here than they are out here, which means the electric field is stronger closer to the charge. So a stationary charge creates an electric field around it that'll affect other charges. But if the charge is moving, a moving charge will create a magnetic field, and that's where all magnetism comes from. So a little preview. Let's say I have a permanent magnet, kind of like we saw in the video, north and a south pole that I'll talk to in a second. If all magnetism comes from moving electric charges and I just have a permanent magnet, what's moving in that permanent magnet? And the quick little answer is electrons. Every atom basically has electrons that are orbiting around the nucleus. And we'll touch on this later, in addition to orbiting, they're also doing something called spinning. And it's these moving, spinning electrons that create all magnetism. Okay, so again, we learned the fact that electric forces can be attractive or repulsive, and it depends upon charge. Opposite charges attract, like charges repel. Well, magnetic forces can also be attractive or repulsive, but they don't depend upon charge they depend upon poles. And so North Pole is really short for North Seeking Pole. If this was a compass or if this was a magnet and I could just hang it on a string, it would rotate and it would align with the Earth's magnetic field. One end of it would point towards geographic north. That's the end that we call the North Pole. And again, I'm differentiating between geographic north and magnetic north. And let me just tell you now why, because it's interesting. Well, no, let me get to it in a little bit, but let me just say that one, magnetic north, magnetic north and geographic north are not lined up. I'll just touch on it real quick. So geographic north is just sort of, in terms of geography, point straight up. So this would be my geographic north and geographic south. But, there's a difference between geographic north and magnetic north. So this would be magnetic north. And your compass always points to the Earth's north pole. Well, I'll get to that in a little while. But your magnet doesn't point towards geographic north. It points towards magnetic north. And if you were ever out in the wilderness and you're trying to use a compass to navigate, you need to know the difference between where your compass points and where true north is and we call that magnetic declination. And I'll get to that on uh, Tuesday's lecture. So second big point is like poles repel, opposite poles attract. Just like like charges repel, opposite charges attract for electricity, for magnetism, we're talking about poles. North pole is the pole of a magnet that points to geographic north. South pole is the pole of a magnet that points to geographic south. Opposite poles attract, like poles 
repel. Another interesting point. And if you want to become a physics superstar, if you found what's called a magnetic monopole, you would be like the new Einstein of the ages. What we know is that every magnet on the planet, in fact, every magnetic thing in the universe, as far as we know, always has a North Pole and a South Pole. It's impossible, impossible to have what's called a magnetic monopole, meaning an isolated North Pole or an isolated South Pole. They always, always, always come in pairs. You can never, ever, ever find a North Pole without a South Pole and vice versa. If you did, the laws of physics as we know it would need to be modified and it would be amazing. It would be like one of the discoveries of the century. But as far as we know, every magnet has a North and South Pole. So. What does this mean? Let's say I took a magnet and I broke it in half. In class, I would have shown you a magnet broken in half, but so let's just say I've got a North Pole and a South Pole, and I take this magnet and I break it in half. What I'm going to end up with is two magnets, each one of which has a North Pole and a South Pole, and the two magnets are going to be weaker than the original magnet. So if I take this magnet and I break it in half, I'll end up with a North Pole here, a South Pole here, but I always have two poles. There's always a North and a South Pole together, never by itself. If I were to take this magnet on the left and break it in half, and this magnet on the right and break it in half, I'm always going to end up with magnets that are weaker than the original, and they're still going to have a North and a South Pole always. Now, here's a cool question for you. Imagine if I just kept up this process and I broke this magnet in half and then I broke this one in half and I just kept breaking these in half and getting smaller and smaller and smaller. This has an interesting implication. What is it? So if I were to keep taking a magnet and breaking it in half and half and half and half and half and half and half, and half what does that imply? Well, eventually I'm going to get down to the atomic level where I'm going to break 100 atoms in half and then 50 atoms and then so on and so on and so forth. If every time I break it in half, I still have to have a north and a south pole, what that means is that atoms themselves are tiny magnets. Very interesting thing. The fact that all atoms have electrons in them that are orbiting the nucleus and as we'll get to, like planets spinning on their axis, we also have what's called electron spin. So as the electrons are moving around the nucleus, one, I have a moving charge just like a planet orbiting the sun. It's in orbit. That's not true quantum mechanically, but in our model, it's in orbit around the nucleus. That's a moving charge. But the electron, just like a planet, is also spinning as it's moving around the nucleus. That is also a moving charge, which creates a magnetic field. Okay, so let's talk about magnetic fields. So one, electric and magnetic fields are both interesting concepts. We can't really see it. Well, we can't see it with our eyes. Don't really have an organ in our brains to sense electric fields or magnetic fields, although some animals do. But the fact that, let's just say that this is a region of space here. This region of space, there's nothing in it. So we're way out in the universe somewhere far from anywhere. Well, if I were to put a charged particle in that region of space, suddenly that charged particle affects the space around it. And what it does is it creates an electric field that will then affect other charged particles. But if that charge is moving through space, a moving charge also creates a magnetic field. And so if I had a charge moving through space, that moving charge is going to create an electric field around it and a magnetic field. So what is a magnetic field? It's just the region of space around a magnet or moving charge that will then affect other magnets or moving charges. 
it's really hard to sort of describe. It's a bizarre concept, but space is physically altered by the presence of a charge or a moving charge or magnet in a way that we as humans can't really sense. But we have ways of measuring electric fields and magnetic fields and detecting them and so on. So a space around every magnet contains a force field called a magnetic field. And the way we describe magnetic fields is what's called magnetic field lines. And a few things about magnetic field lines. One, they give the direction of the magnetic field. So like in this case, if this arrow is pointing in this direction, that's the direction the magnetic field points at that point. Field lines always point from north to south. And the closer the field lines are, the stronger the field. So like here, here's my north pole. Here's my south pole. The magnetic field lines always go from north to south. And where they are closer together is where the magnetic field is stronger. So the field lines are closer together here than they are out here which means the magnetic field is closer, is stronger, closer to the magnet, farther away it gets weaker. And as I mentioned before, all magnetic fields are produced by moving electric charges. And this is one of the things that Einstein ah, showed in 1905, sort of the miracle year. All right, let me take a quick pause, see how much more we need to cover. Uh, it's a bunch. Uh, doo -ba -doo -boop 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 -boop. Let me just cover this last thing about moving electric charges, creating magnetic fields, and then we'll be done for today. So I kind of mentioned, I, I'm not going to go downstairs and grab a magnet, but let's just say I had a permanent magnet. And actually, let's take a quick little pause. I want to go back to this video demo for a second. Does anybody know what kind of magnet this is? Uh, so this right here is a specific kind of magnet. And we have a bunch of them in lab. I would have shown you demos with it. But if you haven't seen one of these before, this is actually a cow magnet. And I don't know if you know this or not, but cows have seven stomachs. And cows will just eat sort of whatever's in front of them. So oftentimes in the process of eating grass, they'll eat little bits of iron or whatever, little bits of nails or things like that. And if they get processed or if they get transferred from stomach to stomach to stomach, it can actually wreak havoc on their insides. And so what they do is they will take a cow magnet, which is a pretty powerful small magnet, and they will actually force it down the cow's throat so it stays in the first stomach so that any metal that the cow eats will get attracted to the magnet and will not pass from stomach to stomach to stomach. Okay, so why don't I bring all that up? Because all magnetism comes from moving electric charges. And if I have a permanent magnet, what is it that's actually moving inside the magnet? It's not like I have a current in it. And the answer is, in a permanent magnet, magnetism or the magnetic field comes from the motions of electrons in the atoms of the magnet. Remember, in our sort of simplified model of the atom, I have a nucleus which consists of protons and neutrons, and I have electrons that are R in orbit. Again, this is just a model, but it's a useful model. Kind of like planets in orbit around the sun. Now, as a planet is orbiting the sun, it's also rotating on its axis. And how we model electrons is, one, they're in orbit around the sun, just like planets in orbit around the, or they're in orbit around the nucleus, just like planets orbit around the sun. But the other thing is we have what's called electron spin. And even though this is not 100% true, quantum mechanically, we model electron spin as treating every electron as if it's rotating, kind of like the planet rotates. In reality, that's not true. What is true is that every electron by its very nature has charge and it has its own magnetic field. There's nothing that you could do to strip the magnetic field off of an electron. By its very existence, it has a certain amount of charge and it has a certain magnetic field. So in an atom, 
I've got electrons that are moving in orbit around the nucleus, and they're also spinning. That spinning electron that's moving around the nucleus is what creates the magnetic field in a permanent magnet. So then the question might be, why if all atoms that have moving spinning electrons, why aren't all atoms magnetic? And the answer is interesting, and it's this. Let's say I had two magnets that point in the same direction. Well, let me put it this way. We consider electrons spin to be either up or down. And this is quantum mechanics. You don't really need to know the nuts and bolts of this. But electrons can have either a spin up or spin down. And it really has to do with their magnetic fields. The important thing is this. In most magnets, it's the fact that electrons have what's called spin, which is really just an inherent magnetic field. That's what causes most magnetism. If that's true, then why aren't all atoms magnetic? Well, it has to do with this. If two electrons spin in the same direction, and again, this is a bit of quantum mechanics, but the key thing is, if I have two electrons that have their magnetic fields pointing in the same direction, that is going to result in a stronger magnetic field. If, on the other hand, I have two electrons that spin in opposite directions, so one is spin up and one is spin down, again, don't worry about the magnetic or quantum mechanical part, but if two electrons have opposite spins, then their magnetic fields are going to cancel. It's almost like why aren't all objects charged if there's vast numbers of protons and electrons? Because for every proton, you generally have an electron. <clears throat> so the total charge is zero. Same thing is true about magnetism. For every electron you have spinning in one direction, you have an electron spinning in the opposite direction, so their magnetic fields cancel. This is why most materials are not magnetic. However, there's three kinds of atoms that in general have more electrons spinning in one direction than the other direction. And those are iron, nickel, and cobalt. <clears throat> now I've simplified it a bit. Some people may say, well, if an atom has an odd number of electrons, so let's say an atom had seven electrons, well then don't I have to have more electrons spinning in one direction than the other? And the answer is yes, but I'm simplifying it a bit. And the key takeaway is magnetism comes from moving electric charges. In any atom, you have electrons that are in orbit about the nucleus and spinning on their axis. It's the electrons spinning on their axis that's the chief contributor to magnetism. And in most materials, electron spins cancel out because I have the same number of electrons in one direction as I do in the other. But in iron, nickel, and cobalt, I have more electrons spinning in one direction than another, which means pretty much every iron, nickel, and cobalt atom is magnetic. Whew! I have no idea how long I've been talking for, but I feel like this is a good place to pause. I have about half the material left. So on Tuesday, I'm going to do a quick little recap of what I've covered so far, and then we will finish up chapter 24. <sighs> that is it. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see many of you in my Zoom lecture on Tuesday morning.